Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation number 330. Recorded January 19th, 2018. Stephen Hoffman. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the Twitch show where we bring the tech luminaries, the people who have thought of the ideas that power your digital lifestyle into the studio, into your world, onto the stream. And we've got a special treat for you today. We're going to be bringing in Captain Hoff, also known as Stephen Hoffman. That's right. He is the author of Make Elephants Fly. It's all about the startup culture here in the Silicon Valley. And, uh, well, folks, he is, uh, he is more than a geek. He is a founding member of the Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, their interactive media group, the co-founder of the San Francisco chapter of the Producers Guild of America. He's on the board of governors for the Producers Guild Media Council, currently the captain and CEO of Founder Space. That's a top 10 incubator in the Silicon Valley. And uh, yes, he is the author of a book that lets you into the secrets, the back rooms of startup culture. Captain Hoff, it is so nice to have you here on Triangulation. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful to be here. Now, uh, first, we have to start with the obvious. Uh, Captain Hoff, uh, where, where is that coming from? Where It comes from gaming. I'm a big-time gamer. I, In my past lives, one of my many past lives, I created many, many games on mobile phones, on PCs, all sorts. So I go by Captain Hoff. Yeah, fantastic. And now we we do. I do want to take people back a little bit because we have to establish your bona fides, as we always do on every show of Twit. Because we've got a very selective audience. They are true geeks. They are people who believe in technology. They believe in the promise of technology. They follow everything tech incredibly closely, and they need to understand how interwoven your history is with some of the things that they know and love so much. Now, early on, your your education was, well, it was unique. You got a, a degree in electrical computer engineering, which, by the way, is the full title. Back when uh, you and I were in college, yes. there actually was mechanical computer engineering. Yours is electrical computer engineering. Then you went on a different track. You, you wandered away from engineering and more towards content. Can you tell me about that? Well, I have two passions. I'm a geek at heart. So electrical computer engineering, I actually went into it because I wanted to create games. Like so many people go into computer science and things like that. That was my passion. I also loved movies. So once I graduated, I got the chance to go to graduate school in, at USC in film school, and I couldn't resist. And I went to film school, created a bunch of films, worked in Hollywood. Then I jumped over to gaming worked at Sega in the early days, making a bunch of different games in Japan, came back here, started my game company, and just kept going from there. Uh, that's interesting because today, if I were to say that one of our guests has that background, that would actually make sense because we've sort of converged entertainment technology that they're all one big pan now. But back when you were doing this, you were a trailblazer. There weren't a lot of people who thought that gaming and television had a natural connection. Yeah, it was a little early for that. So people were asking me, you know, what is this game stuff when I was in Hollywood? And I was, you know, I'd grown up coding. In high school, I was coding away, making my own games. So I said, I just told them, I said, games are going to be bigger than movies. Everything's, you know, it, this interactive stuff, people love it. Um, most of them in Hollywood at that time, in the early 90s, did not believe me. But uh, sure enough, today, everything's moving online. It's funny because you say games are going to be bigger than movies. And of course, our audience understands, well, yeah, naturally, games are way bigger than the movie industry now. But both of us, we remember a time when that was a pipe dream. In fact, it was a silly pipe dream. I can remember when I, when I first started getting into this, people thinking, well, you know, that's fun what you do. But I mean, it's never going to equal a billion dollar movie. Now, if you have a billion, billion dollar title, that's so-so. That's average. That's, that's okay. And it's, it's really flipped. And I, can, can you explain what it was like trying to break into that, trying to convince those people who were used to the old system where the big screen ruled the roost of entertainment and telling them, no, th 
this thing that I'm doing right now, I, I know it looks very rudimentary, but this is the future of entertainment. The reason in the early days I knew it was the future wasn't that I could predict everything that would happen today, because that's impossible, but I knew how completely uh, addictive games are. Like when you start playing a game, I mean, you, I started with early, like the Civ games and all that, SimCity, and you just couldn't stop. They were amazing. Even though the graphics were crude by today's standards, you know, the gameplay just got you. And I was like, you know, there's a lot of people out here who love this, and, and it's just only going to get bigger as technology gets better. Now, most of the people in Hollywood, uh, they, you know, they just didn't get it. That most of them didn't play games in the early days. They didn't know what the allure was. But in the early days, before, you know, when things were going, especially during that dot-com bubble, do you remember that? <laughs> oh, yes. I lived through, we both lived through it. So <laughs> That's when things started to get going. And at that time, I was actually really combining uh, interactive entertainment and media. What I was doing is I had a company called Spider Dance, and we were the first ones to really break through in interactive television. We were doing these online TV shows that would synchronize in perfect time across the country to live broadcasts of TV shows. And we'd feed back the results on air. So our first big show was a show uh, that was on MTV uh, and, and Frank Zappa's son was the host and it was a music trivia show and it was called Web Riot. And it, we got over a million users in, in the very, very early days. Uh, it, it's interesting when you talk about that interactivity because it makes me think of a few years ago, there was a show on sci-fi called Defiance. And they made this big deal because there was also a video game that they kind of played into each other. The, the events of the show kind of touched the events of the video game and, and vice versa. But they were touting it as, oh, this is the first time this has ever been done. This is revolutionary. And, and I remember, I didn't know the name of Spider Dance back then, but I was like... I, I remember this happening before. I don't think this is the first time. But you have all these people, especially the more youngish creators, who are thinking that they, they are plowing new fields when, in truth, it was you and your ilk who thought, no, there's a future in this interactivity. Um, yeah. That, we, that had to be we lonely. Started, it, was, it was tough. It was crazy. You know, that was back. We started in 1998. You can imagine, you know, and we were going to Hollywood and we were meeting, you know, the president of NBC and we're trying to convince them, you know, this interactive thing is going to be huge. <laughs> you, you've got to try it. And they're like, I don't know. But they um, because there's so much hype around, you know, this this new thing, the Internet, they were willing to try. And we lined up a lot of shows. We did uh, a ton of, like, The Weakest Link on NBC. We did shows on History Channel. We did shows on the Game Show Network and Turner. It was really fun because we were experimenting. We were trying things, you know, people had never tried before and getting a lot of users. Okay. We have to talk about those, those consulting years. But before we do that, let me back up one step further because you did mention to our audience that you used to program your own games. And that's that's a question that's going to have questions. People are going to want to know, well, what did you program in? What what were your early games created with? Well, this is going to really date me or <laughs> it's going to really make me look... Uh, I My first game was in Visual Basic. Well, actually, my <laughs> first game was in Basic. Right? It was in Basic. And then I upgraded that game to Visual Basic. The game is called Gazillionaire. And surprisingly enough, that same game that I made in high school is still alive today. People are still using it. It's crazy. <laughs> the newer version on the web. <laughs> I love it. And actually, yes, I, I started with BASIC as well. I think the first thing I actually programmed on was probably a TI-994A. Uh, which had a wonderful tape drive. So, oh, yes, so you wouldn't have to re-enter your programming all the time. You could you know, record it to a cassette, and hopefully yeah. that cassette would work when you wanted to reload it into memory. Um, I remember those tape drives, oh, <laughs> the yeah. cassette tapes. Well, I, I, you know, I just loved having an actual keyboard because the very, 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 very first thing that I ever had was a junked uh, f from my dumpster diving, a Timex Sinclair with the membrane ah. keyboard. Um, I remember. Yeah, I, programming that was a chore and that did not There's have a, a tape drive. I, I had one of the early pets. Oh, yes. The all in one little pets. All right. And then so, I had an Apple, Apple too. <laughs> sir, well geeked. De definitely. Yeah. You, you, you are part of the start of the revolution. Uh, now let's get back into the interactivity because 
this this is a touchy subject for some uh, because, as you explained, it was a difficult time. It was hard to convince these executives that there was a future in interactivity because I, I, I can understand it from their point of view. They had a formula. It works. It makes money. Here's a newcomer who's telling me that this computer thing and this interactivity thing is going to be bigger than the industry that I'm in. And I'm, I'm going to poo-poo that and say, no, it's a gimmick. It's, it's, a, it's a lame gimmick and it's going to fall away and you might do it once or twice, but then people will get tired of it and they'll want to get back into the, the sit back experience of just allowing us to tell them stories. So how, how do you crack through that veneer? Was it just hitting them like time and time again until you could show them the money? Or was there an executive too who actually understood that what you were doing was something that would enhance what they were doing? So the interesting thing about Hollywood is Hollywood people are creative and they're much more willing to try things than maybe other industries so that they were actually ahead of a lot of industries. And that's because if it's cool and different and new, you know, Hollywood will try it to see if it can get more eyeballs on their thing. So they would try it, but they didn't really understand it. And they didn't understand how to design interactive apps and especially how to design an interactive app that correlated with a live TV show. And I'll tell you the hardest thing we encountered. It was not to get them to do it. It was to get them to feel that it wouldn't crash because they kept telling me, the executives at all of these networks, they were like, TV never crashes. <laughs> Computers crash. TV is, uh, you know, when we do a broadcast, it has to be perfect. It can't go down or our network will, you know, will look like you got to promise me it won't go down. Now, we all know in, in the tech industry, when you launch something for the first time and you're getting a huge number of users, you never know if it's going to go down. But of course, I said, don't worry. It'll, it'll stay up. You don't have to worry. But when we launched our very first show on MTV, we launched it. And as soon as it got a huge amount of publicity ahead of time, we had an enormous number of users coming to our servers. We had never fully load tested it because in those days it was really hard. You just couldn't do it. They didn't have AWS. They didn't have the cloud. None of that existed. It was just our servers in some co-located facility. And all these users were coming in. And then it went down. And the M vice president of MTV calls us up on the phone. And he goes, well, I won't. I shouldn't say that. <laughs> he was okay. like, he was like, he was screaming at us and swearing and like, You're, it's down. It turned out it was a denial of service attack. Wow. And our brilliant engineer was able within, you know, a few minutes to block that denial of service attack and get us back on air. So at the, in the, at the end, it worked and they were very happy. But th those were a few minutes where my heart stopped. You know, uh, we should notice that when you say denial of service, you really do mean a denial of service. It wasn't even a distributed denial of service attack oh, back no. then. One one IP with decent bandwidth could take you down. Um, oh, yeah. Those it are the times crazy. that we're living in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so so this this is a process, and you're trying to explain to these executives you know, why they want to incorporate these elements into their shows. But for you, when... When did it feel as if it went from proving the technology, proving the utility, maybe even you know proving that it was entertaining, and move past that gimmicky stage into no, this is here to stay? Okay, it was. It's a gradual process, and with I'll I'll actually uh, tell you the truth. Like Spider Dance was doing really well. We had you know most of the major networks were on our platform. They were paying us real money. Uh, we were so we were cash flow. You know, money was coming in. It was really good. We were growing our business. We were number one in the field. And then the dot com bubble burst. And when the dot com bubble burst, every single one of the networks, the first thing they cut was their interactive right. divisions. Right. So they just killed them. And any spending on anything interactive in those days just went to zero. So that took us down with them. So I enjoyed like this great explosion of, of 
the TV guys willing to try something new and it actually worked and all our shows worked and they, it was really well received. But when the bubble burst, the economics changed and they're like, you can keep doing this, but we're not going to pay you. You have to do it for free or make it off ad dollars. And in those days, there was no advertising for anything like this. Right. There are just no ad dollars. So uh, we basically had to reboot. But I went through many cycles uh, working with entertainment people and it was a gradual process. There was no a clear uh, inflection point where like Hollywood just changed. It was gradually, and there are certain people in Hollywood who are much more receptive and forward thinking and experimental, and there are others who are much more conservative. And you know, let's not let's not paint Hollywood with the evil, ignorant brush because yeah. I mean, this happens in any industry. I mean, oh, because yeah. you were telling them essentially the industry that you grew up with, the industry that you became an executive in, is not going to exist in ten years, and no one wants to hear that. I don't care what industry you're in, you're going to think, oh, this person is an idiot or he's a scamster, he's a fraudster. Uh, but there must have been, there must have been someone who you can remember who really got it. Because, uh, you know, there, there's never this kind of advancement without someone who got it. So for you, who got it? I would say it was more than one person. I'll be honest. Uh, there were a lot, you know, the president of NBC, he, he's a smart guy and he understood, he got it and he greenlit our show, uh, you know, and they were the big, I mean, land, landing NBC for us was the gold standard because in those days, you know, to get one of the big three broadcasters to trust a little venture funded startup, you know, with barely enough money to keep itself going in those days it wasn't like now where startups are you know golden children in those days everybody every big business looked down on startups they're like what are you guys you know how can we trust you we only trust big companies so he got it he took a big risk but what got him over the hump was that we always went first to sell the creative guys. So we sold the creative people first because they were, they wanted to try something new. They just didn't care, you know? Um, and then the network guys were more conservative, but they still had to green light it. So we had to sell both the creative and the business side. Um, and NBC was our really big breakthrough. I mean, we had it before with MTV and a few of the smaller networks, but there was nothing like, like getting on NBC. I like that you're bringing in the startup culture into this and how it's very easy, even today, to look down on a startup and just say, no, 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 get, get out of here, kid. I'll tell you, today it's a thousand times better. If you were in the early days like I was with a startup, like in 1998, and you were just, you know, I was a young kid then, and they didn't trust you. They're like, right. who are you? You know, why should we believe in you? What, what you know, you could be gone tomorrow. <laughs> And it's true. A lot of the startups were gone tomorrow. Well, it was, it was, it really was a different culture. I know it's cliche to say that, but unless you had the beautiful business card and were wearing a three piece suit and you had an address that you owned and you had been in business for 20 years and you had a pedigree that could be traced back to IBM, people looked at you and said, well, why, why should I invest in you? Why should I invest even my time in you because but, you know, obviously you're wrong because we've got sun and we've got apple and we've got microsoft those are the ones we listen to not to not to what was your name of your company again spider dance no no we're not gonna yes. do that <laughs> they didn't and there weren't as many startups so in those days there were far fewer startups than today and it wasn't part of the popular culture and everything like it is today now like everybody wants to be a startup founder you know we we know failure is fine and big companies are pretty much open to working with you there's still some challenges but they're they won't like they won't diss you in those days you had to prove to them that you that you were real and that was hard because, you know, as a real startup, you don't have much, to, <laughs> there really isn't much proof at the beginning. It's just your word and you can smile and whatever else. Yeah. Uh, being a startup today, you, you really sort of have to say, yes, all those things are true. We don't have a lineage, uh, but we have a really good idea. And this is the idea as best as I can explain to you. Um, and you go on that. And I think you're right. I think now people are more willing to understand the potential behind an idea rather than just asking for, okay, give me the 50-page impact study. Oh, oh no. In those days, you know, our business plans had to be like 80 pages. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you oh, I remember that, yeah. that. 
over the next 10 years, you were going to be this big business with all these spreadsheets. And now it's just like 12 PowerPoint slides is all you need. I was like, my God, I wasted so much time on those spreadsheets and that business plan in the old days. I, I went to a launch event here in San Francisco, and I remember uh, there was one startup pitch, and it was a horrible, horrible pitch. But what made it amazing was there was no PowerPoint. There was no salesmanship. He basically, he had like a little gizmo that looked like a pen and he held it up and he said, this, this is the future. If you want to know what this is, come talk to me. If you <laughs> don't want to know what this is, it means you're missing out on a billion dollar idea. Thank you. And he sat down and I thought, okay, that was weird, but he got so much traffic. He got so many eyeballs because people said, okay, that was different. And it, you're not, you're not BSing me. I'll give you five minutes of my time. I totally, I think that's brilliant because I would have run up to the guy. What is that pen? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> because most, most of the, yeah, if you, you know, just saying those few words and, and kind of holding it out there and teasing the audience, that's a great idea. <laughs> I got to remember that the next time I pitch something. Okay, okay. Yes, we, 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 we do have to, to segue into startups because as, as you mentioned, yeah, you are a serial life. startup guy. This is, this is what you do. You like to create, you like to innovate. But I, I want to take a, a, a quick jump back because there are many years before you, you got to be that startup guy. You were a consultant for Disney, for Intel, for NBC. Uh, you worked with Sega, developing interactive games and amusement park rides. So obviously there was a lot that went into your decision to become the serial startup guy. There was a lot that went into your decision to become uh, a startup incubator, to become a VC, to become someone who encourages others to innovate. What were the lessons learned from those years before you became the startup guy? I learned a lot of lessons. Well, first of all, uh, before I became a startup guy, you know, I was working in Hollywood, uh, doing television. I was a television executive doing development work in Hollywood on different shows. Then I met the founder of Sega and I got uh, invited to go to Japan and actually do my dream job, which is make video games. And so who could turn that down in amusement rides, design them? So I went to Japan. But when I was in Japan, the internet was just getting going. The well, do you remember the well? Oh, of it was, course. It was, yeah. you know, it was there. People were talking about it. Wired magazine had come out, and I was reading copies of why the early issues of Wired in Japan. I was like, I got to get back to Silicon Valley. I can't stay in Japan. The action is in Silicon Valley. It's it's it, even though Japan is cool because at that time it was the the king of video games. I was like, I got to get back to this internet thing. Something's going to happen there. So I basically quit my job. After a year, I uh, came back to Silicon Valley, and then I just started – I pulled out that game I had made in high school, and I began recoding it, <laughs> <laughs> remaking it. And I just – I put the game out there, uh, and it was – you know, that – it was, wasn't was really a big decision for me. It was like uh, this is my belief. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, and I work with hundreds of entrepreneurs all around the world, it's got to be in your guts. You, and what I mean is you don't have to have any uh, special intelligence or things like that. Trust me, I don't have those things. But you do have to have that gnawing feeling that I just got to do it. Nothing's going to stop me. I'm going to do this. Uh, Captain Hoff, there is a missing link here because we've heard about why you love interactivity, why you love video games. I get that. I totally get that. And I also hear why you love startups. You've, you've given yeah. us a little peek into that world. But... Connecting the two is, there's still a gap there. How do you go from being obviously a content guy? You develop your own video games. You, you were a consultant yeah. for content creation companies to being the startup guy. There, there, there had oh. to be something that, that jumped you from one to the next. This is the link. I didn't get a job. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's, no, that's honest. <laughs> no, so no, I came back from Sega. Uh, I uh, went and I met the president at that time of Activision, and I had all these ideas that I wanted to create uh, for uh, for video for video games, and he didn't like my ideas. He didn't want to do them at Activision, and so I was like, "Well, if you're not going to do them at Activision, I'm going to start my own company and I'm going to do them myself," and that was it. Um, you know, of course, Activision's an amazing company. Um, my games were more niche. They were kind of just what I wanted to personally do. 
and that was that was my start. Let's let's get a bit meta on that because that's that's an actually an interesting story, and that's what I grew up with in the startup world back in the in the nineties, which was startups were this idea that no one else is doing this and this is something that has to be done and that's why you've created the company that's not the culture today a, a startup today is more i have this idea and i don't just want to sell the idea i want to actually create this i want to turn this into something and then maybe sell my idea it, did do you see when we switched from from one mode to the next of startup uh you know, everybody does a startup for their own reason. Uh, I did a startup. Uh, so different people do it for different reasons. Some people do it to cash out, like to make a big sale. Other people do it, you know, because uh, they, they feel they want to be important. Other people do it because everybody around them is doing it. Um, a lot of people do it, though, even today, because in their heart, they really want to create a product. They really, they have an idea that they, they want to bring to life and they will do whatever it takes. So for me in the early days, I had these games that I wanted to design, that I wanted to make, and I wanted to make them my own way. And the only way I could do that, because I couldn't convince Activision or EA or other companies who I went and talked to, to do my games my way, was to start my own company. So the company was sort of like a vehicle for me to do creatively what I wanted to do. And that's kind of that missing link you were talking about. Like I was a creative person. I also had a technical background and I wanted to make these things. Now today you see people out there like Elon Musk, you know, that are amazing and they're doing it because they want to do it. They're not doing it because to cash out Elon Musk. I, you know, I truly believe that he, I mean, he is driven. He's driven by his mission. On this planet, you know, with Tesla and on other planets with SpaceX, um, he has his mission that he wants to get done. And the only way he can do it is to start his own company. And I see when I see startup founders like that, I have a big respect for them. Uh, this idea of the, the cash out versus the person who actually wants to invest in what they've created. That's actually a really good transition into your book, which, again, mm -hmm. is Make Elephants Fly. It's the process of radical innovation, which... This was a page turner. This was a lot of fun because it, it looked at, I, I guess, the inner mind of someone who would create a startup. What are the things that you look at? What are the what 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 is that idea that you know can become a startup versus that idea that you know that can't? And and, and I want to ask you if you could distill this down for our audience. You've been around a lot of startups, uh, not just your own, but the ones that you've shepherded, the ones that you've incubated. What what do you think is your favorite part? of startup culture. You've alluded to it a little bit because there are certain types of people who are drawn to actually building something up versus selling out. But what would you say is the thing that excites you the most when you look at the startups that are created today? A lot of things excite me. So number one are the people. So I love startup founders. I love people who are passionate about what they're doing. And I love people who have gone really deep into whatever they're focused on. So if it's a, an area of medicine, like fighting cancer, or if it's creating some new web service that you know doubles the speed of the internet, whatever it is, I love people who've gone extremely deep and are playing with new technologies and new ideas, like innovating on, on the design and on the business model and on everything, how people live their lives, talking to them, uh, excites me, right? I get like I'm talking to some of the smartest people in the world and I'm learning so much from them. So while I can help them because I see a lot of companies, they are also helping me because every time I'm working with them, they are allowing me through through their mind to see their business and the challenges they face. So so that's the thing. Okay, I, I get that. And that makes sense. That's, that's absolutely, well, I love it. But what's the counter? Because there's a lot of negatives to the startup culture and a lot of them are being exposed as we speak. But for you, what's the thing that you wish would change? The thing that detracts from the best thing about being next to people with ideas? Well, you know, there's a lot of people who are unscrupulous and that will do will do to different degrees, will do anything uh, to game the system or, you know, get their startup cashed out at other people's expenses. So uh, you look at like Uber, 
and what Travis did over there as when he was CEO. He, you know, he broke a lot of rules and he did things that were, you know, basically not ethical. And he's being punished for that now. And it's too bad he felt like he had to do that to make Uber succeed. I think Uber would have succeeded without him doing that. But uh, that's what he did. And I hope he learned his lesson. Um, he is a, a great entrepreneur, but he's also, you know, not a great entrepreneur because uh, he ended up hurting Uber a lot in the process. Now, we see some of the same stuff happening all around us. Like there are companies out there who literally their startup is a scam. You know, right, they're right. out there because they, they could talk the talk and they can raise a lot of money and they don't really care what happens to their investors or what happens to consumers. And uh, those type of people make it hard on all of us. And there's one area where I'm particularly concerned, and that is in the whole cryptocurrency oh ICO gosh. space. I think a lot of people are going to lose a lot of money and it really and there's a lot of people piling in there and I just don't think all of them are have the best interests of their investors in mind. There there have been actually a lot of us in the the tech industry who have we've been dreading this because I yeah. look I, I I understand the blockchain. I actually understand how the technology works. I see the promise. I see an interesting technology. But the way that anything with the words block, crypto or coin have become buzzwords for invest in me, pump it, and then dump it. it it's kind of scary. In fact, what was it just yesterday? Totally. No, two days ago, BitConnect collapsed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that was one of these things where everybody was warning people, get out. <laughs> this is a scam. It's a Ponzi scheme. And yet, even those, and this, this is the worst part of humanity, even those who knew in their hearts that it was a scam thought, I could probably still make money off of this. You know, yeah. yes, it's a scam, but I'll get out early enough. Um, That's what people are betting on. So, yeah. you know, honestly, you know, Bitcoin, uh, I love people experimenting. You know, the first idea of doing a cryptocurrency, great. Blockchain is brilliant. It's a brilliant piece of technology that can be used in a lot of different ways. But what I see is that the primary value that is being created in these cryptocurrencies that are being issued now through initial coin offerings, the primary value is based on speculation. Right. It's all speculation. Like you say, people are buying these. It's, it's turned into the biggest casino on earth. So while you can't you know, legally online gamble in the United States, you can buy these cryptocurrencies and that's what people are doing. They, it's become a huge gamble and, and the, people know a lot of these coins will collapse. I mean, they, they know, but they're hoping, like you said, to get into a coin early and get out before, before it crashes. You know, the, the funny thing about that, Steve, is, and, and we're, we're going a little off topic here, but um, there are people who look at the cryptocurrency rave right now Yes. And they're saying, well, this is new. This is exciting. And I'm thinking, you know, this is not actually new. We we had this for a long time. Back in the 80s, we called them junk bonds. Everyone knew they were yes, worthless. junk bonds. Get in and then get stocks. out. Oh, Any stock. Right. You know, people do that all the time. And everybody I know who invested in these penny stocks in the long run or junk bonds in the long run ended up losing money. Right. Everybody. Right. Well, but everyone, everyone run, who's a normal person lost. Yeah, a normal person. If you're not scamming the system, right? Yep. If it's your penny stock and you know when to sell, that's great. With these cryptocurrencies, they're giving themselves free cryptocurrency. The, 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 the people doing the ICOs, they're basically handing themselves anywhere from 10% to 30% sometimes of the cryptocurrency. They can sell it off. It's an automatic profit. It doesn't matter if it's worth $1 or, you know, thousands or twenty thousand dollars they they can make money oh let's let's get back to you because and yes this let's bring this conversation in because you again you are a vc person you are a serial startup man you are a founder and right now you are the captain which by the way i love i love that name captain and ceo of founder space here in in the silicon valley um what are the things you look for in a company that you want to invest in, you know, what what are the what are the, the the flags that say okay this person has their their head on right they've got a team they've got an idea that's actually doable and scalable versus someone approaching you and you saying that's a scam I'm not putting my money anywhere near that for for you what's what's the bright line? Okay, the number one thing I look for well is always the people. 
I want to see people who have integrity because you're giving them your money. I, and I want to see people I can communicate with well. I want to see somebody who's the CEO who is a born leader. And I'll tell you, uh, being a born leader means that you can attract other great people on your team because no company is built by one person. I see a lot of brilliant tech technical people out there, but a lot of them are loners and you, and they end up failing simply because they can't get other people involved. At the end of the day, if you're going to build a scalable company, the thing you have to scale first is the people. You have to bring in good people because you can't do it all yourself. So I'm looking for somebody who can attract that talent and I'll look at the other people they brought in and I'll talk to them one-on-one -on -one and ask them, why did you join this startup? What made you join? And if they give me the right answers, which are basically, you know, the CEO is great. I believe in the vision, blah, 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 blah. This, you know, I see the real opportunity. I'm going to forego a six figure job because I believe in this. That gets me really excited. Number two, and this is really important too, that they have to have something that already isn't on the market. I am sorry. There are too many me too products and it's so hard for a me too product to break through. The world is so crowded. And when somebody else already has a product on the market and there's usually more than one and they're very competitive and they have momentum, the chance of you catching up is extremely hard. The only way I know of for a startup to break through is if they have one of two qualities. And let me tell you those. Number one, either they're using new technology so that their product or service is exponentially better than the competition, not incrementally better. If it's incrementally better, you can't win because the other person will just add that little feature or whatever it is and push or you won't even catch up. So it has to be a whole leap ahead of them, a big a, a, like a quantum leap ahead of them. If you can't be exponentially better, then the only other way is for your startup to be different. And that means you have to offer a core fundamental value to your user or your customer that is different than all the competitors so that they will use your product even if they're already using these other products because your product does something. It's not a feature. It's not just a thing. It does something very different than they're using those other products for. And that, those are the things I look for first when I talk to startups. Uh, Steve, how... How do you see the first versus the second part of that answer? Because, I mean, yes, it's, it's actually easy to see when a startup is using a technology or a process that didn't exist. That's, okay, that's, that's a no-brainer. I, yes. I would gather that most of them are going to fall into that second category, though. They're innovating on something that's already been there. Maybe they're yeah. offering a little something extra. And then they've got that je ne sais quoi. They've got that special sauce. They've got that thing that you say ah, culture is different or your, your process is different or the way that you come to market is different. For you, dealing with a startup, which I mean, by its definition is still trying to figure out what it is, how yeah. do you see what that actually looks like? Because it's, it's not developed. It might be developed two, three, five years down the road. So when you're, when you're shoving a pile of money towards someone saying, okay, there's other companies doing what you do. There are other technologies that are like your technology but I like the fact that you have X as a core philosophy. What does you. that look like? I will tell you. So when I look at these startups, you know, they may have a great team, a great CEO, uh, but their product is, you know, not leaps and bounds ahead of anybody else and not totally different. Then how do I decide? This is most startups. How do I decide if I'm going to invest in them? Well, there's one other thing, and that is when I talk to them, that these are the type of people who have gone deep. They have a passion for what they're doing, and they, have, they know everything about their industry. They might not have even worked in the industry, but they are so obsessed with it that they have learned, they've, uh, they've gathered all this information, and where everybody else is stopping here, these guys are going further. They are pushing, they are 
uh, in it, they might not have figured it out yet. They might not, you know, I might not totally believe in their product, but I believe that they are the type of people. They're super curious. They're creative people, and they're and they're and the and they're sucking in knowledge. So I get the confidence, guys. You uh, you you know, you might not have it now, but it's just a matter of time before you figure it out. So you want the madmen. You want the madmen and the mad women. That's I think. Great startup founders are crazy. <laughs> okay, that's 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 actually a good answer. Oh, yeah, uh, they are a little crazy. But but okay, now uh, now I, this is the follow up, which is yeah. I, I get that you, you want someone who's a bit more obsessed. You yes. want someone who really believes in their product or service. You want someone who who is who understands how difficult this is going to be because because they are competing on a culture point rather than say technological exclusivity they need to put that much more into the business to make their model succeed. But then how do you tell the difference between that and to, to call back Uber, an Uber uh, where, you know, they were doing some questionable things and they were doing some things that weren't good for the business. And as you mentioned, things that they probably didn't have to do because the business model would have been good enough to sustain them. Uh, that's, that's the other side of that coin where, uh, you know, again, as a VC, do you draw that line of too obsessed or willing to do too much uh, to, to, to succeed? Well, let me just say, you know, Travis Kalanick, the CEO of Uber, is a good entrepreneur. I mean, he is the type of entrepreneur you want in the sense that he was totally obsessed with his business. He was like driven to make it succeed. Uh, the problem he ran into and what a lot of entrepreneurs run into uh, is it's very tempting to cross the line, yeah. to cross the line in terms of what you're willing to do. Where, where do you say enough is enough? You know, I'm not going to cover up exposing people's credit cards. I'm not going to, you know, play mean and dirty with my competition. I'm not going to permit people just because they're good in my office to do, uh, you know, to treat other employees in a, in a, in a non appropriate way. You know, when, when do you do that? And I think, uh, that's the other area you have to talk to. You have to go deep with the founders on, you know, who are they as people? What are their goals in life? And where in, in their past, how did they deal with their business? And it often you can't tell. I mean, you, you always, as an investor, you can only know so much. Um, and at the end of the day, it's always going to be a leap of faith, uh, whether you give them the money or you uh, just say no. Let's demystify something that uh, I know my audience has heard of before, and that is this idea of the angel investor. Uh, you are an angel investor. You are, you've actually, you are a serial angel investor. Companies include things like Content Analytics, Solano Labs, Pathful, Hipcamp, Tableist, Red Clay, Mouth, Airpair, and the list goes on and on and on. As a angel, what do you expect? I, I mean, actually take this down for us to, to, the, to the person who's listening or watching us in our audience right now. How would you describe the primary job of an angel? So there's a couple things. So almost any angel in the world can do the first, and that's give money at an early stage to a startup that needs right, it. Right. You know, anybody can write a check. Uh, the angels that are really valuable are ones that go beyond that, that actually mentor the startups, that work with them, that uh, can help them see, because most of them have been entrepreneurs before, and they uh, have worked with a lot of entrepreneurs, can help them see the roadblocks that are ahead, that a lot of times a young entrepreneur who doesn't have the experience can't see. A lot of these entrepreneurs now are just out of college. They don't, and some of them have zero business experience. Um, they haven't seen, they haven't gone through the process ever before, many of them. So if you can help them by saying, wow, you're going, you have something really interesting and you're going down this path, but have you considered this? And I've, you know, I've worked with other startups and they've had trouble in this area. And I think that's going to stop you when you get there. How are you going to get around that? So asking the startup founders really tough questions and making them look at their business from a different perspective, that's a big part of what angels do. And then the third thing is relationships. 
Like, you, you know, you and I have been around a long time. Naturally, we've been doing business. We have a lot of relationships. So we can really help them get to the next level in terms of strategic partners, bringing on people to the team, uh, getting further investment, further rounds of investment, all sorts of things. Right. Hey, ideally, an angel is supposed to be light touch. Uh, you know, you, yes, sign the check, give the money so that the, the process can begin, but then back away and trust that the team that you just gave that chunk of money to knows what they're doing. But there, there has to be, I mean, because you've got a very long experience, many years in this, in this field, there has to be that time where y you have to step in and you have to tell a founder, you have to tell a CEO, stop. You're, you're, you're going to destroy this. I've seen this before. Let me, let me recount the five times I've seen this exact scenario and why it ended in failure every single time. When is it time to break out that part of the wisdom, the, the, the sort of the tough love of the angel investor? I break it out right away. Okay. So when good. I meet, <laughs> I have my own style and I've tried many different styles. So I'm naturally a polite person. I don't want to offend anybody. And it's really hard to tell somebody their idea sucks <laughs> or their idea is good, but they, you know, if they keep going down this path, they're going to fall off a cliff. It's just there or it's a dead end. There's nothing going to happen. So I found through a lot of trial and error that if I am just very friendly, a very supportive, but extremely honest right up front, it is the best way. And then if they want to work with me and I want to work with them, great. If they don't, don't. But I always, I don't sugarcoat it for startups. I don't say it in a mean way or an aggressive way or a way even meant to dishearten them. But like just uh, two nights ago, I was sitting with a startup founder. She's great. She's like really nice. She had this idea. And I was just like, look, I've seen 50 of these companies before. None of them have worked. I'm looking at your app, and I didn't say it this bluntly, but I, I pretty bluntly, and I said, you know, you're you're doing the same thing they did. I want you to go look at these other companies and tell me why you'll succeed when they didn't, and I'll give them the give you know give them the name of the companies and talk about it. Now, a lot of entrepreneurs they've worked already by the time they come to me. Uh, they put a considerable amount of their time, their passion, their money into the project, and they don't want to hear it. They really don't want to hear it. Uh, I'll still tell them because I feel like it's my duty. I, you know, I, it's my duty. I'm not helping you by pretending your idea is great. That doesn't do you any good. What you want is my honest feedback. So I'll give them my feedback, but I'll let them make the choice. At the end of the day, it's their company, and they have to decide what to do. I never force an entrepreneur to listen to me. All I'll say at the end of what I said is go out, please go out and talk to other experienced people. Get their feedback. Get as much feedback as you can. You don't have to believe me or believe what I say, but get a lot of different data points and then make your decision. How often do they understand that you're trying to help them? I mean, because again, remember, let's, let's, let's remember the type of person who makes for a good startup. They're obsessed and this is their baby. This is their idea. Then they've, they've grown this from the bottom up and now they're coming to you and they're thinking, I need investment to get to the next level. And you've just slapped the baby, uh, but you've done it with good intentions. You, you said, look, I want you to succeed and you can't do this. This won't work. Yes. How often do they get that versus how often do they think this is an, this is an adversarial role? And you're just being that guy who's trying to cheat me out of my destiny. Uh, it's, <laughs> and I, I have no other way to, to put that because I've actually seen that look on people's faces when yeah, they think yeah. you're trying yeah. to scam me and you're going to take my idea. Uh, what's, what's the percentage? How often will the founders get it? So I would say 50% of the time That's upon the first meeting. That's not bad, 50. Yeah. Well, I... You know, not all of it is extreme, right? Where I'm a lot of times I'm telling them you can keep what you're doing, but switch direction. Uh, you know, you know, maybe 20 to 25 percent of the time, I'll just say it's it's not going to ever work. Um, when you say it's not going to ever to work, I mean, it's it's hard for people. Uh, it's really hard. Now, honestly, it's hard for me to get data because a lot of times they'll nod their head and listen. But I'm never quite sure because a lot of these ones that don't work, I, I don't follow up with them. Honestly, I, mean, <laughs> I just told them that, that it's not going to work. Um, they have to, you know, stop what they're doing and start something else in the extreme case. Uh, 
Um, so, you know, I don't have a big incentive to follow up with them unless they come back to me with a new idea, like they took my advice. Um, but yeah, it's really hard for people. A lot of times they'll hear it once. What will happen is they'll hear it from me. And what I hope is that as they go forward, that they, it stays lodged in their brain. And now they're, they're thinking critically about what they're doing and they're talking to more people. And I don't expect them to, on a dime, you know, drop everything they've been doing for the last six months or a year and make a U-turn just because I told them. But I, I do hope that maybe over the next couple months, they will be, it will begin to sink in and they will rethink uh, the direction they're headed. Uh, let, let's talk about that U-turn because I, there, was a, there was a part in your book, I think it was, it was after page 200 and 200, it was like page 220 or so when you, okay. when you were talking about this exact same thing. When, when, yeah. when an innovator gets to that point where they realize they have to change, they have to change or they die. Yes. And you listed a series of questions. And I think the first one was, was along the lines of um, how is this change going to affect the business model? That's one of the yeah. first things that they, they, have to, you know, they have to look at. You also said you have to consider what resources are you going to need to be able to make the change? And will you have enough resources to finish the change? Because if you just start the change and you run out, you're dead. Uh, and, and then you end it with look at all the possible pitfalls and how am I going to mitigate those? How do I mitigate the impact of what the change is going to take? I'm assuming that that part of the conversations happens after that 50%. When people come back to you and they say, okay, you're right. Um, this isn't going to work. Well, we do we do need to change. Do Is that still an investable idea? Is that if, if a founder comes to you and says, we're willing to make these kinds of changes, do you say, well, here's the check, or do you say, come back in six months and show me that you've, you've made progress? So good question. It depends on the startup. It depends on the team. It depends on a lot of factors. I don't always say, here's the check. Sometimes I would. It, doing what we call a pivot or a U-turn, dropping what you're doing and going on to do something else is hard. Like you say, it's, it, a lot of times it's a restart. Right. Which means you just put six months or a year into this and your life savings and you have to start over. Do you even have the money to do it? Do you have the time? Can you afford to not be working during that time? Can you keep your team together through this uh, radical change you're about to make, this restart? Uh, those are real questions they need to consider. And uh, there's no point in doing a restart or a pivot or a U-turn, whatever you want to call it, if you do not have the resources to keep or the will, a lot of times it's will, to keep going. So they need to make that decision first. Now, if they have the will and the resources and they're determined to keep going, and I really believe in the team, and I believe that with a change that they're making, usually I want to see a new direction before I put in the money. I don't want to have them just say, we're going to start something new, but not even know what it is. Right. I want to see what they're doing and where they're going. And a lot of times, you know, that's based on a lot of the knowledge and learning that they've already done. And they're just heading in a new direction with that. If I really believe in that, then I could step forward and fund it. But if I don't really believe in that, I'll say come back in a few months because, you know, I'm not ready. Oh, this has been great insight from the, the point of view of the, of the angel, of the investor, of the VC. But you've also been the startup guy. So let's, let's flip it around and, and hopefully the, the potential startup people out there can, can actually glean some knowledge from this. When you are looking at being the startup guy, when you are looking at saying, okay, uh, I think I, think I want to do this, what's the first step? How do you know you've got enough of an idea to turn into a startup? This is what I learned the hard way usually your first idea is wrong. Usually you don't have, you simply don't have enough data to even know if it's right. You just have an idea. You think it's cool. I'm going to try something. And that's how I always got started. I just jumped in. Like I just dove in, you know, not knowing anything. Like the first startup spider dance, we had to pivot uh, twice before we hit the interactive TV model. So we were doing first an online a game called Jabber Chat that won South by Southwest and it was really amazing, but we couldn't monetize it. So we were just like, oh my God. And it was the early days of the internet, the brand new. We were like one of the first JavaScript uh, widgets, 
you know, that actually took off. And we had all these websites embedding us with these little chat-like games and stuff. It was so cool. It was so hard to leave that behind. But we looked at the revenue from advertising, and it was zero. And in those days, venture capital wasn't willing to take a chance on something like a little widget. They did not. They didn't get it. So, um, and then we went into providing a back-end system, server system for game developers. But the game developers were a pain in the ass. <laughs> They were. They wanted so many changes and everything customized, and they didn't want to give any money. So we pivoted again. So what I learned in my first startup was that whatever you think your first idea, no matter how cool it is, it's most likely, if it's not totally wrong, which there's a good possibility of that, it's your. It's it's you're going to go through many many iterations before you really figure it out. And so I tell startup founders, don't worry about your idea. Don't even, don't sweat it. Pick an area that you're really interested in. Pick an area that you're so curious about, that you want to learn everything about. And you know what? If you go deep with this, if you engage, if you get out a MVP, a minimum viable product, uh, early version prototype to your customer and the users and they engage with it, or if you're B2B and you go to you go to your customers and you start talking to them, you will begin to learn and keep an open mind that your first idea is only the starting point. It is not the ending point. It is the beginning of your journey. Okay. Now, let's take something else from the angel side, and, and that's you looking for a team. Uh, you, you want you want the, the idea is good, but the team is more important, the, the right type of people. I'm that startup guy, and I've had my first two, three, four, ten ideas destroyed. And I, now I think I, I understand my industry a bit better. Maybe I have that minimal, viable product. What's the team I surround myself with? What's, what's is- the minimal, viable team for me to be attractive to an angel? Okay. We usually don't invest in startups founded by a solo founder. Because if it's just one person, they haven't proven to us that they can assemble a team, that they can lead a team, all those qualities that are so important for a CEO, uh, we don't have any proof. Maybe if they were famous and they already did a bunch of stuff, yeah, but in most cases, no. Uh, What is, uh, so this is what I tell startup founders. It's really important. I say, don't obsess on your idea. Your idea doesn't matter at the beginning. What matters is, number one, where you're focused, what direction you're headed in, and even more important than the direction are building your team, building a great team, because your team will actually help you figure out what the right idea is. So it doesn't matter that getting the right people on your team is important. Now, what do you look for in an initial team? Well, it's very important to know your own strengths and weaknesses. What are you really good at? What do you do like amazingly well? You should focus on that because if you can do it amazingly well, your every, every minute of time you put into that will be amplified by your, your talent and your skill set. But if you focus on things that you are not competent at, that you are not great at, it, it's actually the inverse. You can put in a lot of time and energy and get very little out. So what you want to find are people who are amazing at doing the things that you can't do that are necessary for a startup. So there are two roles that are absolutely critical. And the minimum possible team is two people. One, who a person who is what they call a hustler, somebody who gets out there and does whatever it takes to make the business get off the ground. The hype you know, man. Sales, you need marketing. The hype man. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hype man, everything, right? Bringing on new team members, whatever it takes scrounging up money. And number two, somebody who's technical, if you're going to do a tech startup, who can go deep on the technology and fully execute on that. Not somebody who's just the person who worked as a VP at a big company and is used to just delegating everything, but somebody who's hands-on, roll up your sleeves, tech leader and innovator on technology. Those two people. If I could have a third person on an early stage startup, it's not marketing because you have no money. <laughs> so you're not going to do a lot of marketing. <laughs> uh, you know, the hustler will do all the guerrilla marketing, you know, whatever you can do on no money. What you, the third person you need is a great designer. Somebody who really understands design, understands user experience, uh, can create design thinking, can create, can create a, a product that people fall in love with. And if you get those talents in an early stage startup, I think you're there. 
All right, we, we are almost out of time, but I do want to ask one more question because this is one that I hear on uh, from, from the form of my enterprise show, and that is we kind of live in a world where FOMO is a real thing, the fear of missing out. And I think that's that has insinuated itself into the startup culture. We see it all the time uh, in, in the programming world with feature creep, where we're always adding something so the software is never done. I see it in startups all the time now where they may have come up with an idea. Maybe they even have that minimal viable product. Maybe they even have that minimum viable team. But now they're thinking, oh, well, this other startup is doing this and we could probably easily incorporate that into our process or or the, the, the incumbent, Facebook, Google, whatever has done this. And I, I bet we could one up that. As, as the startup guy, when do you say no? We're not doing that anymore. We, 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 we've locked down what we're going to develop. And once we deliver this product, then we can look at the next. Because I think that's, that's an absolutely crucial role of any startup guy to, to know what's the limits of my team and how quickly can I deliver before my resources run out. So what I tell startup founders is that most people use a product, especially at even a later stage, but al always at an early stage for just one reason. They don't use it for 10 reasons. If you think about, you know, new services or apps you download or anything, you're downloading it for one reason. It might do some other things for you, but you're downloading it or using it because it does one thing exceptionally well, so much better than everything else. So I tell startup founders, put all your energy into this one thing. Make that one thing so incredible that nobody else can rival you because all the other stuff doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. If, they do, if the one thing, the one reason people are using you isn't there, then they, will, they won't use you. It's that simple. So a lot of the other thing is focus. You know, at, at, at a startup, at every stage, but especially the early stage where your resources are limited and your team is limited, focus is so important. You, if you spread yourself out across a lot of different things, you end up going shallow on each one. So none of them goes beyond where the competition is. But if you focus all of your team's energy on one thing, you can, you can get insights and innovations that are far beyond what your competitors are doing. And if you don't know what that one thing is, then you have a problem. <laughs> you have to rethink your startup. We have been speaking with Stephen Hoffman. He is the captain and CEO, founder of the Founder Space here in the Silicon Valley and the author of Make Elephants Fly. It's the process of radical innovation. I want to thank you so much, Captain Hoffman, for being here with us on Triangulation. If you could, please tell our audience where they can find you, where they can find your startup, and, of course, where they can find your work on the Internet. Uh, I'm easy to find. <laughs> you can find me at founderspace.com, founderspace.com. You can find my book at makeelephantsfly.com or on Amazon or anywhere else, Barnes & Noble. It's everywhere. Once again, it has been an absolute pleasure. This has been a lot of fun. I, I love speaking to people who can sort of bring back the Silicon Valley to the Silicon Valley I knew when I was growing up and, and show how it has progressed over the years. This last hour has been an absolute trip. My, my friend, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. I loved it. <laughs> of course, Thank you as well for joining us for this episode of Triangulation. Don't forget that we do the show every week, 3 o'clock p.m. at live.twit.tv. That's specific time, of course. If you join us there, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv and you can chat along with uh, the other members of our chat realm of the Twit Army. Also, please download this podcast wherever fine podcasts are aggregated, but also at our show page at twit.tv. Slash try. That's triangulation. There you'll find all of our episodes hosted by all of the hosts of the Twit TV network. It's a great place to find the inner life of the people that you know only by their technology, only by their products, and only by their innovation. Until next time, I am Father Robert Balliser, the digital Jesuit, saying so long and see you next time on Triangulation. <laughs>